Welcome to Hacking the Truth. I'm Jim Clements. And I'm Bob Wallace. Bob, it's been a while since we've been together with everything going on, but we converse quite frequently and uh, found a book by Krishnamurti, and I'll show this real quick, called Commentaries on Living, and we'll give you a screenshot on how to get it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just led to this book by serendipity, I guess, and when I started reading it, I said, Bob, you need to pick this book up. So give us kind of a quick overview of how you feel about the book. Well, I would say in today's world, we've had a flood of self-help books, and they really haven't helped too many people. So a lot of people feel like they're let down. You remember the book, The Secret? Yes. You know, and which was nothing new. It was just saying oh, old no. stuff over and over again. Regurgitation. And Krishnamurti gives you something completely different. And because one of the problems with Western civilization is that we've been taught to look at outside of ourselves for everything. Most, most self-help books are about being successful, getting, getting a date, uh, you know, making lots of money and all that. And he shows you why that is actually the problem, not the cure. And he talks to us about how to find out what we need for peace and uh, well-being is inside of us. I think the clarity in which this book is written, well, it's a computation of a lot of his his books and sayings that was put together. A lot of this, when you read it, you're amazed it's 1940s, 1950s. You think it was written today about what's happening in society and what happens with people. But really the underlying thought to me or the movement to sit you in the direction is break up the mind-body connection because that's where your problem is. If you desire something, well, that automatically creates a conflict. I must have it. Is this good? Is that bad? Or So you're so locked in the mind, and when you have the conflict, you're either going to reach that goal or you're not, yeah. and then you're what? Fear of failure, and then you fail. Right. Well, the whole Western culture is, is on progress, and that means doing and becoming. So, in effect, we're taught to never be happy with who we are and just be who we are. Uh, we, and we're always looking for outside verification that everything's okay and that we're good folks. Well, when you say get above the mind, people will say the words and think, I know what I'm doing. But here's a very short quote. The mind cannot think about something which is not of itself. So any thought you have is of the mind. So what, where are the thoughts coming from? They're coming from the past. You're taking the past forward. And that thing, well, you know, you learn from experience. And well, mm -hmm. truthfully, if you know, you know, you're gonna put your hand on a hot stove, you're gonna learn from experience. But most people get up and they do the same thing every day. Brush your teeth the same way, do everything, and expect change because they're locked in the mind-body connection. Yeah, that's what, one of the things he brings up is there's a lot of things that are good at a certain level and you need them to survive, but not to prosper. You have to go beyond them to prosper. It's like you do need a certain base knowledge, you need certain base skills, but if you stop there and you try to live your whole life through those, basically you're just recreating the past every single day. You know, it's that old thing, if you live 10,000 days or one day 10,000 times. It's a rut, and I've often said a rut is a grave with the ends kicked out. You yeah. keep doing the same thing over and over. Well, how do you break that mind-body connection? It's tough because you're, you're so programmed, be it by family, by religion, by society, to act and react a certain way. Mm -hmm. You think that you have original thought. You mm -hmm. do not have original thought. Yeah, I mean, they've basically have shown that the average person has a couple thousand basic thoughts that they just think over and over again every single day. And one of the things that uh, Krishnamurti points out is that psychology can help people, and therapy can help people, but basically all you're doing is working with the contents of the mind. And he says, that's not really what's going to work for you you have to work on the awareness. It's kind of like you have a box and your box is your awareness. 
You need to expand that box, not worry about the little contents that are in there. And sure, I mean, uh, you can mix the two together a little bit, but if you keep just playing with the contents of the box, you really don't get anywhere. I mean, you can do affirmations, you can do this, but people have been going to therapists for years, taking drugs for, for physical and psychological conditions for years, and they're not really getting anywhere. So it seems to me like it's time to start something new, which is really doing something old, which is dealing with awareness itself. And he does a very good job at pointing at that. It's like he kind of hints at it and points at it, but and you go, what is he saying? What is he trying to say? And all of a sudden it starts making sense to you. Well, when he directs you back to what your true self is, not what your mind-body connection and what you believe you are. And I think another person who did a tremendous uh, work in this area was Sri Bhagavan and he's, his books on self-inquiry when you yeah. ask who am I? Yeah. No really who are you? Yeah. Not your mind, your body, your personality but if you truthfully believe mm -hmm. that when you pass that your soul goes on then that's who you truly are. Do yeah. you know what your true self is? And I would say 99% of the population does not right. because they believe what the programming has taught right. them. And what makes that happen is they stop asking questions. They assume they know who they are. They assume they know how the world and reality works. They never question it. That it's not just somebody else's idea or a group's idea of how all this works. It's scary sometimes to think how much what's in our heads is just borrowed from other people. We didn't create any of it. So we're really just sort of running along in a set track. I think most of it we've created in our mind. Yeah. That uh, and some of it has been useful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but really the unknown you don't yeah. explore with your mind. Yeah. It's impossible yeah. because right. all you're doing is pulling from past experiences. Right. And one thing I like to say about Christine Murray because a lot of people don't know who he is, <coughs> is that actually he wrote many books and influenced millions of people including famous people like George Bernard Shaw who was a famous playwright, and Aldous Huxley which was a famous author of The Doors of Perception and I forget, there was a science, another, he did a whole bunch of books that were very good. Uh, and he's, he was, every, he, let me put it this way, everybody says, asked him, are you a guru? And he says, no, I'm not. He says, actually, I'm an anti-guru. He didn't like gurus. Right? No. So even though he was an Indian, he was educated like in France in the Sorbonne University, and he lived more than half of his life in California. So for people that get put off by Asian stuff or Indian stuff, this has got nothing to do with that. No, in fact, he would go around giving talks and then they would form groups to discuss his works or whatever. And then as it progressed, they wanted him to be the head of this nonprofit and build this. And he said, he just split from them entirely. Yeah. He said, no, that's the problem. I don't want to build a church. I don't want to build a foundation. I don't want any of that. Because all that is, you may be, uh, you live in a self-constructed prison. It may be a little nicer than your neighbors, but it's still a self-constructed yeah. prison. And one of the amazing things about the book is that they are all discussions. I think it's 89 or 98 discussions that he has with people, many of whom he never met before. And some of these people traveled all around the world, thousands of miles to talk with him. And he has this uncanny ability to look through their question and see the truth of that person. It's really remarkable. Yeah, I, th I think if you, my personal opinion, if someone would read this with an open mind, it would shift their consciousness on a daily basis to start not just accepting what they see as truth, not accepting what they hear as truth. That's the first start. Yeah. You've got to be open to it. If you won't open, yourself to it and most people don't because of fear because if I start talking about this or searching for that my family will feel this way if I'm in the mm -hmm. church I'll be shunned if I'm well that's the price of knowing the truth it's not it's not what you think it is yeah I've always liked the idea that 
the first time around, we're made by all the outside influences. Our families, our cultures, our, our language determines how we think. The vocabulary that we have determines how we think. But at some point, you get a chance to decide what kind of person you want to be. And certainly following his advice, you'll find things that, it's like they point to what you're going to be because you ain't going to believe what you're going to be. No. You have you a couple able quotes. to in your quotes? Um, I have one on something that's important. It's called uh, identifying. And a lot of people don't realize that they gather things that they think are important and make them part of themselves. An easy example is a sport team. If your sport team wins, you get so excited, you get pumped up. But if they lose, oh, you're down in the dumps. You've identified with them. Your self-esteem rise up and down with them. And it happens with the groups you belong to, the country you're in, the jobs you have, and it goes on and on. And you're trapped by all these things that you've identified by. Let me see if I can find Well, you're that. living in a divided mind, good, bad, always. So if you do okay. that, you're, your, your demeanor, your thoughts are okay. going to be constantly, did I win, did I lose? Yeah. Here's a quote, it's called Psychological Security. It's a, just a small part of what he was telling this person. He says, the desire to gain, individually or for a group, leads to ignorance and illusion. This desire is not only for more and more physical comforts, but also for power, the power of money, of knowledge, of identification. Identification gives pleasure and power. You are no longer lonely, confused, and lost. You belong to the party, to the idea you are safe. After all, that is what most of us want, to be safe, to be secure. To be lost with the many is a form of psychological security. To be identified with a group or with an idea, secular or spiritual, is to feel safe. Once it has experienced the pleasure which identification brings, the mind is firmly entrenched and nothing can shake it. Well, I mean, how many people do you know that are just locked into a position, be it religious, political, whatever, they won't move. They feel the safety within that group of people. But if they say one thing that that group doesn't like, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden the group turns cold toward them. So that group doesn't grow. That group is shrunk. And they're afraid to lose their sense of safety. Exactly. So fear holds them in place. So if you leave this, this terrible thing's going to happen to you. Cults. But cults yeah. aren't just people who say, uh, get on a spaceship, we're leaving the earth. Cults are mm -hmm. mental. Mm -hmm. There are cults in politics, there are cults in religion, there are cults in idealism. You can go on and on. But to break free of those, People say, well, I don't need to do that. I'm a free thinker. I don't know why I'm listening to Bob and Jim. I know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. You do not know what we're talking about. You think you know, and it's above thought. And that's hard for people to grasp. I used to think I knew what I was talking about. Then I started this inquiry 50 years ago, and I found out how little I knew what I was talking about. Yeah, they say most people never change their mind. I think I change mine daily. Well, you can yeah. if you have an open mind. Of course, we have certain rigidity there. And, you know, in the masters of the Far East, certainly you think of gurus and you know, people and beards and turbans. This is nothing. That's still, you are your own guru. You are your own savior. Nobody, I don't care what you believe, can do it for you. Mm -hmm. That's spiritual laziness. Yeah. to think because you believe something, everything's going to be okay. Right. And as, as far as we know, we're the only beings on this planet that has, have true self-reflective awareness. And how much attention do we pay to developing it? Not a lot. Not a lot, which seems very, very secure. But a lot of people don't want you to think for yourself. They want you to be like the group. They want you to be a productive member of society. And don't get me wrong, you can be a member of a group and a productive member of society 
and do what we're talking about because that's just part of being a human being. I like to say I live in the world, but I'm not part of it. Yeah. I love my country, but I don't love my government. So, you know, when you can look at it with an open mind, then you're going to see a lot of cracks. There's a lot of things that can make you uncomfortable when you start realizing how fragile society is. And I think we've seen it with riots in cities and mm -hmm. people got scared. Yeah. You know, we've seen it with supply chain. We've seen uh, supplies at the grocery store. We live in a very fragile world. So if, the, yeah. if a group of people is making, making you feel safe, you're living an illusion. They can't do anything when there's no food in the store. Right. And definitely we've seen the problems of what happens when people's security is, is jeopardized or they think it's jeopardized. People start doing drastic things and, uh, you know, we can certainly, you know, we don't, we'll do maybe another show on COVID, but part of the problem with COVID is the psychological consequences of everything that's happened where people feel less secure. And so they grasp for security. Yep. They look for someone to tell them, I've got the solution for you, right? And if you're doing what we're talking about, you don't need to go ask for someone for security. No, you don't. Uh, one thing, I'll, we'll wrap it up and uh, we'll show you where to get the book at the end. But this is from a different set of books I read. It's The Life of the Masters of the Far East. And this one part, and I, certain things I read every day, there's two pages here I read every day and I can get into that later. But speaking of disease, why certain people get sick and others don't. Why do people catch colds all the time? The other person never gets sick. Here, this is a little insight. Now the Siddhas are, were very enlightened people, some of the most enlightened people. This is from them. No inevitable old age process exists within your body or group cells. Nothing that can gradually paralyze the individual Death is then an avoidable accident. Disease is, above all, dis-ease, absence of ease, joyous peace of the spirit reflected through the mind and body. Senile decay, which is common experience of man, is but an expression that covers his ignorance of the cause. Certain diseases and conditions of those mind and body even accidents are preventable by appropriate mental attitude, says the Siddha. The tone of the body may be so preserved that it may naturally resist with ease infectious and other disease like plague or influenza. The Siddha may swallow germs and never develop disease at all. Yeah. So how positive is that? to get your body in tune with what we're talking about. Well, for me, what brought it home was when I came to the understanding that if you're in peace, then you have a whole different series of chemicals running through your body. If you're in fear and anxiety, you have a whole other host of chemicals going in your body, which produce the conditions that match the emotions that you're going through. Well, and as long as you're seeking everything outside of you, you're always going to feel anxiety because you always can lose what's outside of you. Well, it's epigenetics, the restoration of our cells. We have a mm -hmm. complete new body every nine months. It's kind of interesting because it takes nine months to be born, truthfully. Yeah. But what you're putting in your mind mm -hmm. affects your body yeah. and all the tension and all the anxiety. Stop watching CNN and uh, what is it, Fox News and all these and six. Forget about it. Pick up a book and read it. Calm yourself. Your whole life can change if you do that. But if you constantly have that mental food going in, you're defeated. You don't have a chance. Yeah, I think we saw a show one time where they said, the first thing you need to do is stop looking at the news in the morning. Yes. Right? Contemplate, but, read a good book, something like that, and you'll start your whole day right. Your right? morning is... And this is a great one to start with. Yeah. What's nice is the chapters aren't, the conversations aren't 30 pages long. 
they're like three and four pages. That's it. And that's yeah. all you have I read to do. one a day. Yeah. And that's focus on that and think about it during the day. Yeah. And what you brought up in the morning, I'll end with that, is very important. It's like a ship with a rudder. What you do the first 30 minutes or hour of the day is your rudder for the entire day. So keep that in mind. Try that for a while. And read a good book. Yeah, read a good book. Thanks for being with us. I'm Jim Clements. I'm Bob Wallace. We'll see you next time on Hacking the Truth.